It's day five of painting the wilderness seascapes, my friend. And to end this first half of the challenge, I've decided to show you how to paint a really serene, kind of idyllic sunset scene. We're heading to the forest, we're heading to the river, and we're gonna paint a lot of really subtle silhouettes reflected in a very kind of bright and calm sunset scene. So this project focuses a lot on reflection and this project focuses a lot on, you guessed it, careful layering and contrast, as do pretty much all of the projects that we're going to practice throughout this challenge. So I hope that you really enjoyed this one and let's get started. Okay, so with this project, something kind of interesting, if you remember, on day four, the Cliffside Waves project, I didn't love the end result. And that's okay. I talked about how that's okay. This time, day five, for this River Reflections project, I loved the end result. I really love how it turned out, and I love... I loved the process getting to it, and so I'm really, really excited to dive in today. It was kind of a nice way to, you know, bounce back from that other project that wasn't, wasn't my fave. So for this sunset project, we're going to use some fun, bright colors. Uh, we're going to mix a, a kind of soft coral orange with opera rose and lemon yellow deep. We're also going to use phthalo blue um, or Windsor blue. Both of them are relatively the same. And um, the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to wash off my moon palette because I want to use it for mixing and I want to mix that coral color and it won't, it wouldn't have played well with the other colors that were already on there. So I just kind of wiped it clean. And in order to mix this coral color, I'm starting with Opera Rose, which is a fun kind of neon pink, pink pigment. And when I'm color mixing, something that is important to note, when I'm color mixing beforehand, like I'm doing to kind of prep, I'm using a size six brush, not a size 10. Um, and that's because I want there to be like not as much water to pigment um, when I'm mixing the colors because I want them to stay, you know, like fairly light. So I'm using a smaller brush um, to do that. And so I mixed that kind of orange color with Opera Rose and Lemon Yellow Deep. And then I have some Yellow Ochre and Lemon Yellow Deep um, as kind of this yellow mixture I'm also going to use. So I'm gonna use the wet on wet technique and meaning I got my whole paper wet before I started painting. And now I'm using my size 10 brush to create just some of these wispy kind of clouds on the paper with that coral color. Important thing to note is if your paper is too wet, then when you try to paint these wispy clouds, the paint is going to go all over the place. Notice how I'm intentionally leaving behind white space. I want there to be white space between the clouds. And in order to do that, again, you need to make sure your paper is not too wet. And one kind of really effective way to do that is to, after you get your paper wet, to let it dry for a few seconds before you continue painting. But either way, if you start painting and you realize, wow, my paint is going everywhere, that's why. So on this layer, I also, as you can see, added some yellow, um, some yellow to the clouds in random places, kind of mostly along the bottom of the sky. But when you're painting, I don't want you to think, oh, I need to put these in exact places or, oh, I need to paint the reflection so it is exactly mirroring the sky. That's too, that's, you don't have to. <laughs> you have my permission. You can make it wild and you can make it random. And the reflection does not have to be an exact reflection because in fact, you know, we're actually not going to be able to see tons of it. We're, we're going to be able to see subtle amounts of color. And so it's okay. It doesn't really matter if the reflection right now is exactly reflecting. What matters is that you have both colors in both places. So I let that uh, sky layer dry all the way. And now I'm adding some Windsor blue or phthalo blue. 
like I said, either or. Um, I'm adding some blue, some kind of bright blue to the sky in the white spaces between the colorful clouds, and it is messy. <laughs> I added only a tiny bit of pigment and it went all over the place. And so I took a deep breath and I did what I do when pigment gets messy and I need it to be more soft and delicate is I use a thirsty brush, which is a damp, clean brush to kind of lift the paint off the page. And then I also used some, just some like clean water to kind of, uh, you know, soften the edges around the blue, maybe lift the blue off of some of the clouds. Cause I don't, if, as you can see, sometimes if the blue like ventures into the yellow, into the yellow bits, it turns green. I don't really want that. It's also kind of unavoidable. So, but I do want to try to mitigate that as much as possible. So I have actually very little pigment here. I also do want to have some bit like light spaces between the blue and the clouds. And so this is going to be messy. Adding the blue is going to be messy. And it's mostly like adding a little bit of blue and then using a thirsty brush to lift the blue away from the edges of the clouds. And so as you're doing this, if this feels like this is not going the way that I want, this is not going the way that I intended, that's okay. It is totally fine. You're not alone. And in fact, one way to kind of avoid that, to, to avoid making the green is you don't even have to paint the yellow. Is like if you're painting this and you're thinking, oh, I just don't know how that's going to go, you can just you know, keep the, keep the clouds on the coral pink side and then add the blue and um, then you won't get the green. You will get like a muddy kind of muddy kind of purple when you mix that coral with the, with the blue. But, you know, like I said, this is one thing that it will be good to push yourself to try to paint clouds like this. And it's also okay to say, mm, not my thing. So, you know, you do you. So I let that layer dry and then I re-wet it again. And now I'm just adding a little bit more coral to kind of add that pop to kind of have it um, be a little more vibrant against the blue sky. One thing that's, you know, about color theory to note here is that orange and blue are complementary colors, right? Which means that when they mix, they don't go well together. Um, but when they are composed in the same composition next to each other, they can kind of vibe off of each other and make a really bold statement. So um, that's just kind of one, you know, side note. Um, next, I let that layer dry and then I painted this as that very thin mountain to separate the sky from the river. So the mountain is very light value. It ha I used Payne's gray and I used a lot of water in the mountain. So it looks kind of far off into the distance. I let that mountain layer dry and then I re-wet just the bottom part, just the water, which is where the river is going to be. And along that bottom part of the river, I'm adding some Payne's gray and some phthalo blue um, just along the corners. And as I'm doing that, you know, some of the color gets kind of muddied up um, as I'm kind of darkening the corners to make it look like there's, it's water, right? To make it look like there's shadows like in the water. Um, and so I did add a little bit more color, but like I said, we're going to be painting lots of things on top of the river. And so it's not that important. Um, it, it is important, but what's more important is I just, I want some color to be there. So, you know, as you're thinking about that and thinking, ugh, this is so messy and muddy and all of the colors are gone. It's okay. It's really going to be okay. So we let that dry all the way. And now I'm painting two little silhouettes of, you know, like mountain or pieces of land or whatever, kind of jutting into the river. So this is the first side jutting from... Um, you know, kind of the center and it almost looks like a, a triangle shape, right? Uh, except it's clearly a mountain. So there's like some rough edges. And then I painted some trees along the, uh, along the top ridge there. And the way that I painted the trees was just, um, you know, thin lines for the trunks and then very, very loose. I'm not trying to paint necessarily individual trees. I'm just trying to get the general shape of these silhouettes. So like there are pieces of land that are jutting into the water and, um, you know, kind of providing depth for us, right? Because we have that mountain that's off in the distance, 
uh, that is a lot lighter value that looks more blue. And then with these silhouetted mountains that are, you know, right in front of the sky, right in front of that mountain, but also layered in front so that we can tell it just, it gives us that depth, that distance that we are kind of hoping for, right? So with these, with these mountains, I'm using Payne's Gray, very, very pigmented Payne's Gray. And they're both super loose, just like flat on the bottom and then kind of triangle shape going up to the sides. Now I'm going to paint their reflection. So I got that paper wet again, just beneath the mountains. And I am loosely going to paint some kind of watery Payne's Gray in the shape of a reflection, um, you know, just underneath. And the nice thing about the wet on wet technique is that, um, you know, having the wet on wet technique makes the reflection blurry, which is what we want anyway. We don't want the reflection to be super crisp. This is a detail, one of the details that really pulls this together for me. So I'm using a thirsty brush and I'm using a thirsty brush to lift just like a few thin lines across the reflection. My hand is covering it up for this one, but you'll be able to see it more for the next reflection. Those thin lines are like ripples in the water. And it took me years to figure out, <laughs> it took me years to figure this out. Um, years of me painting things like this. But if you use a thirsty brush, and I'm using, when I paint the ripples, I'm using a very, very small, like I'm using a size two brush. I'm using a size two thirsty brush. When I paint the ripples, meaning I'm using a thirsty brush so it's damp, not very much water, and it's clean to lift some of that pigment away, the ripples add such a tiny effect that you might not even notice it, but it just kind of makes it look like water. Instead of a bunch of color, instead of a random reflection, it makes it look like water. And so sometimes it's those tiniest details that really pull scenes like this together. Um, if you don't, if you're not very adept at using a thirsty brush or it's not quite working the way that you want it to, um, one thing I would suggest is as you're lifting it, you could try like kind of twisting your brush a little bit, or you could even use white gouache to just paint lines right on top. That would work too. But those tiny ripples in the, in that reflection, and remember the reflection is wet on wet. Thirsty brush doesn't work wet on dry. It only works wet on wet. Those ripples made such a huge difference for me. So now we're going to paint one more kind of little rock thing jutting, <laughs> it's like coming up from the river. It's a silhouette. And so I'm painting the rock and then I'm immediately going in with kind of a wet brush underneath to, to kind of paint a little reflection. And I didn't want to get the whole lake wet. And so I'm just kind of, you know, just kind of creating a reflection just right there, just underneath the rock. And then I'm feathering it out. Um, there might be some dried paint lines that happen when I do that, but I'm gonna, we're also painting trees uh, in the very foreground. And so I know that, you know, it doesn't really, it, it's okay if there are some dried paint lines for that tiny little reflection because um, I'm gonna cover it up for the most part, or at least have a detail in the foreground that you won't really notice it that much. So the last thing that I'm going to do is to paint these trees. Um, and whenever I paint trees like this in a long line, really these are tree tops, right? Because um, those aren't, we're not trying to paint tiny trees. These are just like the tops of trees that are coming up. Uh, I like to paint all the lines first so that I know I'm paint, I'm not evenly spacing out my trees, okay? So I don't want any of my trees to be evenly spaced. I want them to be all different sizes. And especially I have like four really tall ones. Um, I want them to look uneven. I don't want them to look symmetrical. I want them to look kind of sparse. I want them to look kind of jagged really. And so as I'm painting these trees, I'm intentionally not making them look the same. I'm intentionally, um, you know, using kind of loose blobs to create an uneven effect. And that's it. <laughs> I'm done. That's my whole project. Um, if you, we haven't done lots of tree painting in this challenge because this is a, seas a seascape challenge. So if, I mean, on my YouTube channel, I have lots of tree painting 
I have lots of tree painting tutorials. In my original Painting the Wilderness Challenge, which was mainly landscapes, there are lots of tree painting tutorials there also. But the main takeaway I want you to get from this tree painting, especially those tall trees, is again, I'm intentionally making them imperfect. I'm intentionally making them uneven. And I'm not doing it to, so that they look like cute, imperfect. I am trying to make them look natural. And so one of the things I always like to say is imperfection is realistic when you're painting nature. And it's something I think we forget, right? Because it feels like the stakes are so high because nature is so beautiful, but nature is beautiful precisely because it's imperfect. So leaning into your own natural human tendency for imperfection is going to really help. So, ah, isn't it so beautiful? I mean... <laughs> Sometimes I feel like, uh, I feel like such a dork for saying I just painted something beautiful, but I don't want you to feel that way. So I'm not going to feel that way. I think that I painted this one and I remember thinking, wow, that one was great. And it was pretty simple, right? Not very many layers. We had a few layers for the sky, but then the layers of the silhouette just kind of like made it all pop together. And, um, Anyways, yeah, so this is one of my favorites. So let's talk about now what we've loved versus what we learned. This is, in case you're jumping in on this challenge without looking at any of my previous tutorials, the whole loved and learned framework is something that has really made a significant difference in my creative practice because I can stop to remember all of the things that I really, that brought me so much joy during the process. And that's an important thing to remember that when you're picking out the three things that you love, it's not just about the end result. It's not just about the three things at the end that you really like that you made. It's also, and maybe even more importantly, about the moments throughout the whole thing that you really loved. The moments that you remember going, wow, that was so cool. Um, those are the things that I want you to practice noticing because those moments are what will kind of get you back to painting again and again and again. So for me, the loved and the learned, um, there are some obvious moments that I think I, I said as they were happening. I really, really loved using a thirsty brush to create those tiny ripples in the reflection. Um, I also love creating clouds this way. I love making them one layer at a time like this because it just feels so fun to add tiny bits of color a little bit at a time. Um, and then I really liked how my trees turned out. I love how the trees were wild and, and kind of, you know, imperfect, but I loved painting them that way. I like how they turned out and I enjoyed the process of getting there too. So some things that I learned is, um, in order to paint wet on wet, we did a lot of wet on wet work here. You kind of need to pay attention to when you need to re-wet in case your paper dries too quickly. Um, I also learned that silhouettes really make colors pop. And what's important here is that I use Payne's gray, not black to make my silhouettes. Um, just because I think that using black pigment kind of washes things out. Um, I also learned that imperfections and wild strokes can be hidden, right? Like we had lots of dry brush strokes. We had, I had lots of quote mistakes here, but they can be hidden when you have such brilliant pops of color like this. So I super loved this one. I hope you loved it too. And I will see you next time. <laughs>